Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have a timer. That's good. Does it start automatically? <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Um, look, we've been really fortunate over the last two days to have a series of fantastic talks, so I thought I'd do something completely different. Um, and that's a sort of warning for you. Um, and a bit like Todd, I was reflected on 30 years ago, yes? And so I look back over my lab book, and 30 years ago to the day, I was developing a synthetic respiratory tract lining fluid, which became the basis for our developing of the oxidative potential assay. And I'm still, to this day, not certain whether that was the best decision I ever made or the worst decision I ever made. But we're going to go on, we're going to talk about it a bit. Now, clearly, I've come forward with a bag, and there's a fundamental law in any public talk, which is beware the man who walks onto the stage with a bag. Um, it's, always, it's always a man. It's always a man of a certain age. And a lot of my talk is going to be about time, yes, and how things move in a circle, because I have become the man with the carrier bag <laughs> walking onto the stage. Now, there are a few things I've got in here, and they're really, really, really very important. Um, so let's begin. I've got that there, and I've got this on this side. And this is to remind me that in my talks, I'm always really incredibly negative. And somebody said that I shouldn't be negative the whole time. I should try to have a balance of saying positive things. So um, I've already said we've had a fantastic time, so I'm going to take that as a win, OK? Don't expect that to change very much over the next 20 minutes. Now, let's reflect on being 30 years. The one thing I'd say is that those 30 years have flown past, haven't they? But my journey started a year before that. Now, I'm going to show an image next. And I, I think under convention now, I have to say there should be a trigger warning. OK? <laughs> Just mentally prepare yourself for what you're about to see. I've had to prepare myself. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, in a bizarre way, um, the, the talk after this is going to talk about biological aging. And here. <laughs> We have a fantastic illustration of just what the wear and tear of 30 <laughs> years um, can produce. But yeah, well, it's somebody, my, my group looked at this, and they said, how, did, how is Frank younger than you? <laughs> um, but you've, you've got to bear in mind. Um, and I looked at this, and I was, thought, I was thinking, well, you know, it, it's quite male, isn't it? Um, but it was the era of the, the boy band. But not all the boy bands made it clearly quite to the same extent. So look, here we are. We're in 1992. And I wanted to reflect back on 1992, because some of you weren't even born. It's horrific to even consider this. So let me tell you about 1992, OK? It's really important. There'd just been a major royal celebration in London. The Queen had had her ruby jubilee, yes? But it was also the Queen's Anna Cerebellus. It was a terrible year, yeah? Lots of bad stuff had happened. Divorces were going on. Um, Princess Diana had published a tell-all book exposing the secrets of the royal family. Imagine that, <laughs> OK? A war had broken out in mainland Europe. The Bosnian War began in 1992. It was never meant to have happened. We were never going to have war in Europe ever again. And also, we had a deeply unpopular government who had just had a tremendously unsuccessful budget, which had resulted in a massive devaluation of the pound, <laughs> and had taken the United Kingdom economy, which had been stagnating for about eight years, into full recession. The party was mired in scandal and arguments, and there was this, at this core, this big argument about Europe, yes? Um, and so what I wanted to say is that's 1992, okay? 30 years ago, and that doesn't sound terribly different from today, yes? And the reason I wanted to say that is um, most of my examples today are going to be white men. I'm sorry. <laughs> so this is Mark Twain. And he has a very famous quote. All historians know this quote. We often say that history repeats itself. It doesn't repeat itself. But it does rhyme. History does rhyme <coughs> itself. And so I suppose the question I asked myself was, how about the science? How about the science of air pollution? Where were, was the science of air pollution in 1992? So at the back this afternoon, I did PubMed search. 
and I pulled out a whole list of papers telling us what we were studying and what we knew back in 1992. There are lots of papers about diesel, how bad diesel is, about how diesel fumes is associated with respiratory symptoms, about its genotoxicity, about its health, and how we should be doing something about it. There are lots and lots of papers about indoor air pollution. Indoor air pollution, damp, mold in the household. A really interesting paper I came across talking about the genotoxic effects of cooking aerosols. It's all there. And that's okay in 1992, but sometimes, we, you know, very often in air pollution, 1993 is also the publication date of the Six City Study, isn't it? We kind of sometimes think of that as being a very important date. But let's not forget, there's a good 50 years of particle and fiber toxicology and health studies going backwards before that date. And we sometimes forget it, and that actually it wasn't year zero, okay? That, I think, is in in incredibly important. The other important thing which happened in 1992 happened in Rio between the 4th of June and the 14th of June. It was the first Earth Summit. It was the summit where the Convention of Climate Change was first drafted, which then went on to go to Kyoto and then on to the Paris Accord. It was the period when the biodiversity argument was first raised. And if you go through the things which are under discussion in 1992, they included the design of better cities, better transport solutions, reducing the dependence on fossil fuel because of the health impacts on our health. It talked about the need for systemic evaluation of chemicals entering our environment, including emerging chemicals of concern. That was 30 years ago. And so a lot of my talk today is going to be about revisiting what has happened in the interim and how successful we have been. The scores haven't changed yet. Let's start on point one. Here's an interesting question. There's a paper back in 1992, which posits the following question. What is the harmful part of PM 2.5? <laughs> I have more props. This is half a kilogram. I'm going to put it over here. I think this works. Half a kilogram. Let's just say this is salt. I'm going to have to make so much bread after this. That's salt. That's uh, half a kilogram. Uh, this is anthrax. Um, uh, let's see what else I've got in here. I've got um, flour itself, not hiding itself. I've got ethanol, and I've got hexadentate chromium. Nobody who's a toxicologist would sit down and say, you've got 500 grams of each. They're probably of the same toxicity, yeah? Um, if this was anthrax, 10, 10 to 20,000 spores inhaled is enough to kill an individual. 500 grams, most of London's population. Flour, well, that's fairly home harmless, isn't it? Unless, I suppose, you're gluten intolerant. But, of course, there are, there are occupational diseases. Yes, you could have bakers, hypersensitivity, pneumatitis. That's a devastating occupational disease. Um, we have salt has a toxicity at the right dose, but also of a long-term high levels associated with hypertensitivity. Ethanol, I didn't go to the party last night or the drinks last night, but I'm sure some of you have slightly inflamed brains as a consequence of that. And chromium-6, cancer-causing agent. Lung cancer, sinus cancer, a whole host of cancers. So they're all different. And you would think, I'm a mad person to suggest they should be the same. And they all produce toxic effects through very different underlying mechanisms. OK, so that's straightforward. You would think that's the tritest, most ridiculous example anybody could ever make. So let's just modify this. Let's make that the semi-organic aerosol. Let's make this semi-inorganic aerosol. And we put some copper on this one. That's copper. Make this elemental carbon. Make this microplastics. And we treat them the same. And we treat them the same because we say 
There is insufficient evidence in order for us to say that one is any more harmful than the other. I'm not going to criticize that. But if you're a toxicologist, that's like saying the Earth isn't round, isn't a sphere. That's flat Earthism. They clearly are different. They were different 30 years ago. The fact that we still don't know which is the most toxic component is something which I think, as a toxicologist, should bring shame to our discipline. And does it matter? Does it really matter? I think it matters massively. It matters in terms of policy development, and it also matters massively in terms of public communication of the impacts of the toxicology of air pollution, especially as our air pollution limit values get lower and lower and lower, closer to what we might regard as being a tropopheric background. Because if I wanted to reduce PM2.5 to the maximum extent, I would go after some of this inorganic aerosol because there's a big chunk of PM2.5. Um, I might then not go after primary diesel emissions because it's actually a small percentage of the mass. And so you end up potentially making decisions to hit a target, which is set with very good reasons, but you might be looking at the wrong thing, not the most harmful component. And it also causes this communication issue. And we've seen this with the debate about the ultra-low emission zone, yes? And the confusion which is caused when you talk to the public about nitrogen dioxide and PM2.5, because we are reducing NO2. We're really not having a massive impact on PM2.5, and we wouldn't expect to, because the diesel contribution to the mass is quite small, but the public know that the health statistics which are being used are derived on the long-term effects predominantly of PM2.5. And so this causes confusion, and in the confusion, there are actors who will try to use that against us, and I think we have to be much more nuanced, but it's a big, big problem. The other thing which I wanted to point out, and again, it built on yesterday. Yesterday we were talking about models, and we were talking about personal modeling, and I thought one of the things which never gets mentioned in European meetings, always gets mentioned in American meetings, is dosiometry. Yeah? How much of this stuff do we actually breathe? How much do we retain what is its fate within the human body, yes? If we were doing pharmacokinetics, that would really matter, but we generally don't think too much about it, yes? And I think that that's another gap we have. We don't have enough information about biological dose. And therein is another problem. And it's a huge problem, I think, but a problem which I hope in the next talk we'll see there's some avenues of hope, okay? So I'm gonna, I said hope, so I'm gonna give myself another, another one there. there. We have toxicological models which tell us quite a lot about acute responses. But most of the health burden associated with air pollution is long term. And we have fewer good models of long term effects. We'd have to go to animal models and do them for a long time. And we certainly have very few biomarkers which tell us something about the chronic long term accumulation of toxicants within the human body. There may be a way forward in that, in terms of how we can use some of the data that comes out which looks potentially at accelerated aging, and whether there are biomarkers which links to that. But that temporality is something which we don't talk enough about, and that problem. And I always sit there in these meetings when people talk about the problem of air pollution being invisible, and I do still struggle with that because people have worked out that viruses are bad for their health um, and they can't see those either. I still think the biggest challenge for air pollution is the effects accumulate very slowly within the population, many of the big ones. And unless you're really vulnerable and you're acutely sensitive, yes, most people don't know that the air pollution they're breathing is harming their health in the long term. So it's a kind of temporal displacement of exposure and effect and we haven't really got a handle on that yet either. Next on my list is mixtures. We're rubbish at dealing with mixtures because mixtures are horrible problems. In fact, in reality, of course, every piece of particulate matter research which has ever been done is a study of mixtures. And I think in the previous 
com you know, comment Todd make, actually, if we're thinking about microplastics in the environment, we really do need to be thinking about microplastics in the environment in the context of the mixture and the context in which they're breathed, yes? Otherwise, it makes no sense, okay? We need a much more holistic view to this. We are not great at mixtures. Um, and that's kind of why I was playing around with that synthetic track lining fluid all those years ago to try to think of something which would amalgamate certain chemical features, certain biophysical features of the aerosol into something called oxidative potential, yes? The name, I apologize for. We actually came up with the name in, a, in an HEI report, yes, as we were having a debate, and I had big problems about whether it would confuse the chemists and it infuriated them, I can tell you that. Um, and actually, if you ever want to know what oxidative potential is about, we did a series of HEI reports on the congestion charge and the low emission zone, and very few people have read the detail in those reports, and so they have misused and misinterpreted what oxidative potential is for about 15 years. I moved out of the field because it was quite a toxic environment to be working in, strangely as it would happen. But nevertheless, it was an attempt to deal with the mixture question. And when you deal with mixtures, there is no simple answer, yes. It is very, very complicated. So, the next thing I want to talk about, I have a list here of things I'm going to talk through, and none of this has been particularly bad so far, so let's go through some of this. One of the things, and my title was about correlation. Um, and again, this is going to be another critique. If you say correlation to causation, I think most people in the audience think this is going to be the classic battle of the epidemiologists and the toxicologists, yes? I completely disagree with, with that contention, yes? I think the reason I have it is it's because something the general public are saying to us increasingly. When you say we have to do this, there are house statistics that say it's a co they have begun to say that's simply a correlation. Where's the causation? They want and they need that extra toxicology. They need that, those human studies to demonstrate that there's an effect. They really do it. And what I would always say, and I've said this to you, Rosamond, a million times, yes, what people need is the pathology, yes? The pathology is where the truth lies. Show people the pathology, and then you win the argument when it comes to air pollution and chronic health. I think that it's incredibly important that we get that right. However, this is going to be my next critical comment. I went back through my notes, and um, oh, we, oh, it's the other side. No, this is negative. Negative. Oh, OK. Well, there you are. Go this side. <laughs> I'm going, to give, I'm going to have another negative there for losing my perspective. OK. Um, <laughs> so, so, I forgot what I was saying. What was I saying, Frank? I often forget what I'm saying. <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> it's completely gone. <laughs> Could anybody remember? I mean, if you don't remember, I don't blame you. <laughs> pathology. Pathology, pathology is, is absolutely everything. And we would sit down, and everybody says, what we really need to do is to get the epidemiologists and the toxicologists together into a room, because we need to learn to speak each other's languages, yes, with the exposure scientists. And when we do that, there'd be some great big sort of panacea, utopian moment, and we will all be able to do work, yes? So I went back over my notes, and the first note I have in my notes about somebody in a meeting with me saying, this is great, we are sitting down together, epidemiologists and toxicologists talking together is 1996. Yes? So I think if all those years later we still are saying to one another we have to learn our language, we ain't been trying hard enough, yes? And we've got to deal with that. So I did get there in the end, I did remember what I was going to say, that was a relief. Okay. Now, the other reason I think that toxicology is important is because of this. Again, look, I've got, I just put people in here, poor Simon, I thought I'd have a poor Simon quote. It's not just the general public who cherry pick information, yes, who only hear what they want to hear and disregard the rest. Sometimes we as scientists are guilty of doing that ourselves, and we have to actually be honest about the fact that we can sometimes be a little bit selective in our use of the data. This means that we have to have all our ducks lined up in terms of our narrative when we go to the population, yes, including making sure we use appropriate language. Uh, clear today, earlier on, you used the word when you were talking about evidence of the degree of certainty. I was so happy to hear the word certainty as in terms of the degree of uncertainty, purely because when you say to the general public, 
there's a degree of uncertainty about this, they conclude you know nothing about what you're talking about, yes? If you tell them that you're 75% certain, they're going, there's something there, yes? And that's really important. I think we have to get that right. Now, again, these are my favorite people, and the next person um, is my spirit animal. If I have a spirit animal, I have to tell you, Douglas, whenever things are going horribly wrong in my life, I always say, what would Douglas Adams have done? And the reason I've put this here is because it's actually important about the nature of the discussions that we're having at the present moment in time. Douglas Adams was not always a fan of science, yes? He spent a considerable proportion of his career ridiculing us, yes? Very well and very accurately. But he had an epiphany moment later in his life and actually became very involved in environmentalism and, e and, and ecology. And he, this is from a, a, a series of essays he wrote, which were put together after he died from the Salmon of Doubt. And it says, all opinions are not equal. Some are a very great deal more robust, sophisticated, and well-supported in logic and argument than others. And yet our system of debate is set up to compare polarized conditions opinions as being equal and equivalent. Somehow we have to do something about this, yes? It's been a huge problem in the climate debate for years. It's entering our field. We need to be able to demonstrate that we have the weight of evidence across domains to bring to this question. My final quote. What's the score? Three, three, two. I'm trying to get to an equal one. This is from Andrew Marr, um, and before he had his stroke, he had completed a book on the history of the world. It's a fantastic book, yes. He goes to the history of the world, but bits of the history of the world, which generally historians don't quote. And at the end, in his final chapter, he makes this statement, and I think this statement's really important in terms of tempering all the optimistic statements that we've had so far, and to give a level of sort of, sort of I would say, dampen down hopes a little bit, I'm British. Science strides ahead. Politics stumbles around like a drunk. Science evolves. It changes, it flexibles. The political system is as it has always been, and we have to accept that. We saw it in the age of discovery, the age of empire, but it was particularly glaring in the 20th century, and I would add, so far, the 21st century, too. I think this is absolutely true. We're taking our, our information to people to infer policy, but the political machinery has not evolved. It is still a bit of a problem in terms of our communication. Now, the beautiful thing about this book is right at the end of the epilogue, there's this lovely section. Um, and it's something when I read it, it stuck with me a lot. And sometimes we live in a world where we're always having our differences highlighted and not our similarities highlighted. We are all humans. We are all homo sapien. Homo sapien is the wise human. In fact, to be specific, we're homo sapien sapien. We're twice wise, apparently, yes? But we're the subspecies which didn't kill all the other subspecies, which may also have died because of environmental factors. There's a lesson to be learned there. In this prologue, he makes the observation, we were probably not really named terribly well. We may be many things, we haven't been wise. We haven't been wise in our custodianship of the planet we operate on. And I would argue that what we really are are clever humans. We're undoubtedly very clever, very innovative. But we aren't wise because wisdom doesn't come from generating new knowledge. Wisdom comes from the application of knowledge for the public good. And so I'll leave you with that. Let's aspire to be the wise human. And let's aspire to make sure that all of the evidence is brought to the table for the benefit of public health. Thank you. I'm going to make that 3-3, three, three, if that's OK, which is an exciting draw. <laughs> Thank you, Ian, for a really enlightening and important talk, actually. We've got some questions, or a few, back there. Uh, an excellent talk. It was really fun to, to, it's important to step aside and not just focus on what the data says today. Um, having 
sponsored a massive effort in epidemiology and toxicology integrated together to try and figure out which particle component was most uh, toxic and have, having failed uh, at HGI. We basic, uh, one of the things we found was that the basic tools we had, no matter how sophisticated they were, were just too limited to really be able to side by side compare. So we, we could find positive and, and, and dangerous effects from every single particle. Um, and it was very hard to compare them one to one. I, I will, um, one question I have is whether we, we could tie ourselves in endless knots with trying to get to that next stage and agreeing that not all particles are created equal. Um, uh, and is it better instead to be focusing on control strategies, mitigation strategies that are multi-pollutant? In other words, that just say, we're gonna do things that are gonna collect as many of these toxics as, as possible. You know, the diesel particulate filter is a good, the catalyzed diesel particulate filter is a good example of that. Doesn't solve the problem, but it just says, all right, we agree, we've got to get rid of some, a, a range of these things, not just one. That, that's my question. So I, when we have these talks, they always put the aerosol science up and it's really complicated. And we always are quite conservative about putting up the, the underlying biology because it's much more complicated than the aerosol science, yes? And so there is a chance, well, there's a likelihood in the fundamental truth that you create effectively an uncuttable Gordian knot of complexity, yes, in which you can never get a simple answer. And if that's the case, then the logical thing to do is to say source. Let's find the sources of interest, because if we capture the source, we capture the aerosol and its heterogeneity. My cautionary note would be, if your source, which is very health relevant, is only 2% of the mass of PM 2.5, do you invest your money in that? or do you go for agriculture, because it's a larger factor of PM 2.5. And for me, therefore, the toxicology needs to be a little bit more fine in its thinking about trying to actually predict what could be the, un the, unavoid the unwanted consequences of making a, s a very subtle policy misstep, which has a large ramification for public health. Thank you, Ian. Eloquent as ever. <laughs> I think we have to be really clear with one thing, though, and that is that understanding a causation pathway is never an excuse for inaction. Um, because if we were doing that, we'd still be taking thalidomide or giving thalidomide to pregnant mothers, for example. So, so there's never a case for inact of waiting for the causation pathway to take action. You know, you can take action based on the evidence from the epidemiology, and that's perfectly fair to do. But there's quite a discussion within the regulatory field at the moment, particularly in the application of the approach methodologies about protection versus prediction. And essentially what we're involved with in the environmental science is protection. And epidemiology can do that. Understanding the causation pathway helps because it helps to inform policy, helps to inform those things which you need to target better. If we want to do prediction, then it's necessary, and particularly if you want to approach, put new approach methodologies in there, then you've got to understand the causation pathway. So it's a different... It's a different argument. So both are important, but I think at the end of the day, we need to be really clear that it's not always necessary to understand fully the causation pathway in order to take action. I, I completely agree. But I would also say in some circumstances, we don't have to wait for the epidemiology. I mean, a... <laughs> okay. So it's kind of... Next well, Frank. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> It's the last question. Yes, sir. Thank you for a great talk. Some of the last quotes really resonated and how I feel sometimes in translating evidence to policy. So just ask you for your comments. Would you be more on the red or the blue in advising us how to move forward? We've never had more knowledge. The political system has not changed. And also your question about opinions, or well-argued opinions, but there's also opinions that are false facts that are fooled not by arguments, but by lobby and profit. and they seem to be winning against the well-argued opinions and knowledge. Yeah, so some reflections, how do we move forward with translating? So in terms of translating messages, the reason I did this is I am notoriously dour um, and have never said anything in my entire life which could ever be mistaken for hope. Um, <laughs> um, but I, there's a little part of me which thinks the, the world needs people like me because there are people who go to musicals. 
um, who are <laughs> pathologically happy and cursed with very poor taste in music. And so I, I think we kind of need this, this kind of balance, yes? Okay, I do think there's a risk that if you go to people and say, here's a problem, and here are the solutions, if those solutions aren't really solutions, they are just kind of like, this is to make you feel better. You're damaging your case because you're making the public feel it's not such a significant issue anymore. So I, I, I don't mind if people say, but this is terrifying. I would say, yes, it is terrifying. And you should realize it's terrifying because it was terrifying in 1992 when they told you about it in Rio. And 30 years later, nothing has happened. Look at the atmospheric CO2 graph. Okay, from 1980 to 1992. You can find it online. Each of the COP summits is marked on that graph. There is no change in the trajectory of that graph with all of the conversations, all of the talking about it, because I think people were too cautious in telling people they shouldn't read. It will be solved. Technology will come around and rescue us. So I'm on the side of telling people how it is, not necessarily sugarcoating it. Okay. On that note, I think we should stop. Thank oh, you very I, much. I, that's negative. <laughs>